This was a statistic that just absolutely shocked and staggered me when I went through the intel intelligence literature. So, you know, it is illegal in the United States to induct anybody who has an IQ of less than 83. And the reason for that is, you know, that the American Armed Forces have been conducting intelligence research for like more than 100 years. And that was partly because they needed a way of sorting people rapidly during times of, of military expansion during wartime. But it was also because IQ tests, and especially in the early part of the 20th century, were used to identify, let's say, the deserving poor who could really benefit from additional educational attainment and advancement. And the, unit, and the military was hoping to identify people from lower class strata that could be uh, streamed into, say, officer training programs and so forth, or, or even skills training programs, to, to move people from the underclass into at least the working class and maybe above. So they had a bloody stake in this, man. They wanted to yep. find people, they wanted to sort them properly, and they wanted to do social good when they weren't just trying to win a war, let's say, which often also is a, a social good. But what happened was that by, I don't remember when this legislation was introduced, but it wasn't, it was in the later part of the 20th century. But their basic finding was that by, say, the 1980s, they had determined that if you had an IQ of less than 83, there was not a damn thing that the, that the army could do, the armed forces could do, to transform you into someone who could do something that was more productive than non-productive. And the ter terrible thing about that is that it's about 10% of the population. And so... You look at a statistic like that and you think, oh my God, you've got this, 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 this enterprise, this massive enterprise that's chronically hungry for people. That's right. It's always, they're always looking for people. They're really oriented towards taking people from the underclass and lower working class and pushing them up the societal strata. And during wartime, they're actually desperate to bring in recruits, period. And their conclusion is that 10% of the population can't be trained to do anything anything sufficiently useful to make them militarily operable. It's just, I just read that, my jaw just dropped. It's like... Well, yeah, it, you know, in the United States, we have about 330 million people, and because of the distribution, the, the relatively normal distribution of IQ scores, about 16% have IQs of 85 or less. Right, right. Which means they're not going to graduate school. No, it means that from, from what I've read practically, it means the Wonderlit company has actually done a really, they have a nice IQ test from the commercial perspective. You know, it's actually psychometrically valid. And they've linked IQ levels to, uh, to job, specifically to job categories, you know. Yes, I, and, yeah, I know. Not, and not, well, what I was going to say is they're not only not going to graduate school, they're not going to find a, a stable job that pays a livable wage. Yeah. Now, especially even given that so many of the service jobs now require a fair high degree of, of computational savvy, or no, I mean, not computation, but ability to interact with complex computational technology. Even the typical till at a, at a checkout market, or, or the till at a McDonald's, because McDonald's is actually very complicated, is, is often far beyond the ability of people who are on the low end of the intelligence distribution. And they claimed, I think it was Wonderlick, Although it might no, it might have been it might have been Hunt, what's his name? These uh, IQ researcher is it Earl Hunt? I think possibly. Earl oh, Hunt. What he claimed that that if you have an IQ of below ninety, that it's it's difficult it's dif difficult for you to read well enough to translate what you're reading into action. So you can't actually read instructions and follow them. You don't have that level of literacy. That's and, correct. Yeah. So so I, I was going to say that in in the United States. This bottom 16% translates into 51 million people, yeah, right. including 13 million children who are in school. Right. This is a very difficult problem. Now, I knew Earl Hunt. He passed away last uh -huh. year. knew him pretty well. He also would say that there is this uh, uh, cognitive segregation in society. This is a point that Charles Murray makes. Yeah. Makes. Well, and Earl would often ask, uh, you know, when's the last time you had someone over for dinner who wasn't a college graduate? Yeah. Well, that was something that Murray and Herrnstein wrote about in their book, The Bell Curve, which really struck me, because I read that book twice, unlike most of the people who <laughs> criticized it. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that, that, that they pointed out in there was, look, the, the, typical, the typical educated person 
thinks that someone isn't very bright if they have an IQ of 115. So this we're talking about the gra graduate, graduate level and PhD level research institutions, right? Because 115, there's, there's as many people at 115 above as there are at 85 and below. And right. so it's a minority of the population, and that's the top 15%. And, you know, that's, that's the duller undergraduate. Right. And so and you just, people have, see, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I've dealt with people who had I, ranges in the low 80s and tried to find them jobs and tried to train them. And I, I have some real knowledge about the stunning gap between people at the low end of the IQ distribution and the high end. And it's, it's no bloody wonder people hate IQ research and intelligence research because it reveals a set of seriously uh, dismal facts about the in, incredible range of ability among human beings. Well, yes, um, uh, this, this is true. And moreover, I would add to this that people in universities, professors and, and graduate students, uh, have a hard time understanding what, the, what everyday life is like if you have an IQ of 80 right. or 85. And you're making your way, you're living independently, you're making your way in the world. But it is a challenge. <laughs> it is a real, I mean, uh, just challenge. It just barely begins to describe it. I had, a, I had a client who, he probably had an IQ of under 80, the nonverbal portion of it anyways. And um, he was indistinguishable in physical appearance from, from, let's say, I hate to use the frame normal person, but there, there's nothing mar that marked him out about particularly intellectually impaired, you know. And... Uh, I tried at one point. This is this this was so so telling to me. I got him a uh, an int, a volunteer job, which by the way is very difficult. It's harder to get a volunteer job than a real job because you have to do police screening and all sorts of things, and the selection process is just as extreme. But I eventually ended up getting him a job at a bike store, bike slash bookstore, and but that place couldn't hold him once the uh, subsidy program had expired. And then I got him a job at a charity. And his job was to fold letters into three so that they could be put into envelopes. Well, that sounds easy, except that he also had a bit of a motor tremor. And, you know, it took me about 30 hours to train him to fold up a piece of paper with sufficient precision so that it could be put in an envelope rapidly so that the envelope wasn't so mangled that it would get stuck in the automatic sorting machine. And, you know, there was high performance demands on him, too. He had to whip through those letters pretty quickly. And then sometimes the letters would have a photograph appended to them that was stapled on. And they weren't always stapled on in the same place. So then he had to calculate how to fold the paper over the photograph without bending the photograph in precise thirds so that it would still fit in the envelope. And then he had to separate the French letters from the English letters and associate them with the proper envelopes. And like that level of complexity just did him in. You let, know? Me, and so, yeah, let, me, let me say two things about this. One is, I hope, common sense, and the other is pretty provocative. The common sense thing is we have to be very careful when we have these discussions not to devalue the human dignity of people who aren't in the upper end of the distribution. And if there's one criticism that I think is fair is sometimes in these conversations, it sounds like we're devaluing people at, at you know, the lower end of the distribution. And we have to be very careful that we don't do that. Uh, human life has dignity and IQ is not the most important thing that defines human yes. beings. Even yes, it's not associated with wisdom. It's not necessarily associated with truth or with courage or with many virtues that, that are being likable. Humble. Right, it's not it's related like? at all with being likable. Yeah, or honest. Yeah, like, that's right. That's how many of well, we know the psychometric, the psychometric relationship between intelligence and conscientiousness is zero. Right, right. So, so I think we have to make that point. Yes, I think I agree. I agree. I mean, no, I'm tr trying to make the point about how difficult it is for people who are on the low end of the cognitive spectrum to survive in a in an increasingly complex, cognitively sophisticated environment. Right. Their jobs are just disappearing. 